Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Resor. I'm a third-year PhD student here at the iSchool. I'm going to talk today about some of my past work, which was conducted in Kenya in 2015 and 16. Um, at the time, I was collaborating with a local technology company called Mathri Root uh, to crowdsource information about road accidents in Nairobi from social media posts. A difficulty we faced was that most of the people did not enable GPS location services on their mobile devices posting on social media. In this presentation, I'll explain how we came to understand this non-use and create a system for geocoding posts uh, by their location descriptions instead. Um, someone just wave at me when the slides come up, and then we can catch up. Uh, so I was, OK, great. Um, OK. I was trying to collect road, road safety data because while accidents were a serious public health problem in Kenya, as they are in much of the world, at the time there were no data that included usable location information for accidents. <laughs> Yay, okay. Here's Nairobi. Here we go, you haven't missed much. Um, now I've lost my place. Uh, okay, no usable location information for accidents, which is crucial for policy making and urban planning. My three route, my collaborator for the project, is a crowdsourcing platform that you see on the right here um, that was already successfully generating transit information via their mobile application and Twitter account. With over 500,000 followers on Twitter, theirs was one of the most followed accounts in Kenya. They were the source for radio traffic reports, and most of the taxi and bus drivers who I spoke with referred to using my free route throughout the day to navigate Nairobi's notorious traffic, of which a very bad example you see in the middle. Um, my free route users were already reporting some accidents, so we decided to launch a campaign to raise awareness about the need for accident data and encourage users to report all accidents by offering random small financial incentives on a weekly basis. However, we knew from previous work that a significant majority of my three root users chose not to turn on the GPS in their mobile devices, meaning we could crowdsource information about the accidents, but it would not come with embedded geodata. We could have tried to change this behavior of my three root users to try to get them to turn on their GPS in favor, in return for another financial incentive, or perhaps just by informing them how to turn on the GPS in their device. However, these approaches assume that the users either don't know how to turn on the GPS location services or have reasons that could be overcome by a small financial incentive. Focus groups with my root users and discussions with the my root content moderators revealed a very different story. They gave several reasons uh, for GPS non-use such as users were concerned about saving their mobile data credit, this is a pay-as-you-go system, um, or battery life, both of which they worried were spent more quickly when their GPS was activated, and or they were concerned about the possibility of their privacy being invaded, either by the government or by personal contacts. Given these reasons, the leadership, the Mathri Root leadership and I decided not to try to correct the non-use, but instead work with it. GPS is, after all, just one way to describe a place, specifically a point in space that is often used to refer to a bigger place, a street address, a neighborhood, a city, et cetera. In Nairobi, like much of East Kenya, East Africa, and perhaps much of the global south, residents navigate with landmarks, road names, and narrative-like descriptions, like turn right after the second speed bump, drive to the top of the hill, uh, blue gate on the left, that's where my boss lived that summer. Um, this method works equally well in parts of the city that do have marked street names and house numbers and those that don't. Unlike GPS, which works the same basically in any part of the world, uh, these descriptions required a certain amount of local knowledge, even when they were on social media. One must be able to recognize the landmarks and road names, uh, which were not always fully written out. A, a certain number of Excuse me, a certain amount of context is also assumed. For example, my three root users rarely specified that they were talking about Kenya or Nairobi. They jumped right into the descriptions of where they are. Uh, this is because my three root is explicitly about Kenya. It's a self defining online community, even on Twitter, where the tweets can be reaching a global audience. In this sense, choosing not to use GPS is opting out of a globalizing system as much as it is opting out of a technical product. 
working with GPS, which we, I've illustrated here, um, means creating a system to map these colloquial descriptive locations. We needed to render them with, ge with geo coordinates in order to map them with GIS, a necessary step for visualization and spatial analysis. So we assigned coordinated coordinates, excuse me, to landmarks on major roads and use these coordinates for posts that were that included the landmark and road name. So on the left, you see a map of all the landmarks that we mapped in Nairobi. That's most of kind of central downtown Nairobi. Um, and on the right is kind of an example with an actual comment from someone that mentions Thika Road, which is a major highway, and Kasarani, which is both a neighborhood and a bus stop and a school, all kind of in that blue area. Um, so this is kind of giving you an example of how that system is working. Um, landmarks could be, for example, bus stops, roundabouts, government buildings, schools, shopping malls, business plazas. On its own, a landmark was perhaps not specific enough uh, because it might border more than one road or have more than one branch across the city. What we had recognized was that landmarks and roads created a folksonomy of space in, in Nairobi. Wu et al. defined folksonomy as a user-generated tagging system characterized by a lack of hierarchy and adaptability where users share common interests and vocabulary. Hashtags are the obvious example of a folksonomy on social media. Uh, mostly, as you see here, landmarks and roads were not uh, denoted with hashtags in the Mathri root community, but their recurring frequency made their tagging function possible. Uh, this existence of a folksonomy might have been completely overlooked had we had the option of using embedded GPS from the start. Okay, so often when I discuss this research project, the first question I'm asked about is the accuracy of the geo data. But what do we mean when we talk about accuracy? Accurate for whom and for what purpose? In this question, there is a presumption that embedded GPS data is more accurate, and I wanna push back on that. An embedded location only tells us where the device was when it sent a message. By the nature of crowdsourcing, users are not in the exact same location of the event they are reporting. Usually they're nearby because they have to see it, but their message is embedded with their location, not the events. Using the embedded GPS of, post, of a post on social media does not take into account the time that it can take to write and post it, particularly if you're in a moving vehicle. Um, plus, price-conscious users may wait longer until they can use free wireless, perhaps at home or work or in a cafe, to upload their post. So even if all the accident posts had embedded geodata, the geodata would have been more descriptive of the poster's locations than the accidents. And especially for Nairobi, some users have internet-capable phones that don't have a GPS in them. Um, so a project that incentivized turning on GPS and only used GPS embedded information would have excluded those people. And so this is kind of a visualization on the right here of the central business district of Nairobi and kind of how your embedded locations could be so far wrong. Um, Finally, it is true that using a landmark and road to indicate the location of an accident does not give the exact location where the accident occurred. Was it directly in front of the landmark, a little before or after, where on the road, the center, the curb? However, in place of the specificity for an individual accent, accident, we were able to group together accidents that happened near the same landmark. The implication was not that they happened in exactly the same place, but that they were happening near each other. And for policymakers, this association of multiple accidents is very useful for showing the severity of accident hotspots, um, such as here. So this is a heat map uh, showing the areas of concentration labeled with their Nairobi landmarks. This was made for a Nairobi audience, so if you lived in Nairobi, this would be meaningful to you and not very surprising. Um, at first, GPS non-use seemed like a hurdle for this project to overcome, but it became a defining challenge that drove the project to meet its value of prioritizing local knowledge and striving for a data collection process that was explainable and encouraged community ownership of data. 
uh, our understanding of the user's refusal to use GPS indicated that it was not a refusal to participate in the Mafri Root community. So we felt that it was important to include these users in the crowdsourcing effort in a way that would not only rely, that would not rely on changing their behavior. Landmarks, in this case, were a vernacular system for describing space, and using them centered user agency and put the results in familiar terms. Yet creating and deploying the landmark-based geocoding system for Nairobi accidents required the local knowledge and context of Nairobi. So this was not a project that could have been done remotely despite social media being a medium that's praised for its ability to be accessed anywhere with an internet connection. The result was a data set that was largely accepted by the public and public policymakers. Um, it reflected a familiar reality, but at the same time was able to quantify lived experiences in such ways that provided journalists, advocates, and policymakers with new evidence. Uh, thank you for listening and bearing with us on the technical issues. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions. I also want to thank my collaborators from Mathriroot and the Mathriroot users, of course. Uh, during the project, I had mentors at the University of Nairobi and the MIT Civic Design and Data Lab. And finally, CTSP, um, for which I worked with my friend and collaborator, Angela Okun, to kind of come up with this framing of non-use and refusal among particularly Kenyan tech users. Thank you. So thanks for a great talk first. Thank you. Um, I applaud the use of NLP here. <laughs> Attempted. Um, the question I have is about uh, what this data is being used for, because accident detection on an app like Google Maps is useful because it can change the decisions that you make, right? To, to route to some different path or just not go in the area where the accident's taking place. In this case here, if you don't have, well, I mean, one of the benefits of GPS is that you have real-time information mm -hmm. about where you are. In this context, a person could be posting an hour later, two hours later, you know, some future time um, uh, that's not directly involved with the accident happening at that point. So if it's not being used to make real-time decision making, what are people using this data for? That's a great question. Um, so as working with a company, the company's aim was to try to come up with a real-time system. Um, a little fun NLP background in Nairobi. Um, and Kenya is a country where English and Swahili are two of the national languages, but there are more than 40 other languages and dialects, and people often will put them together. In Nairobi, particularly, people speak Shang, which is an English Swahili slang that often will have like an English verb with a, a Swahili beginning or ending, or vice versa. And it changes, and it's incredibly neighborhood driven. So we initially thought, oh, great, we'll do this with NLP automated. It'll be great. That never really got anywhere. Um, some other people, not me, thankfully, are still working on it. So that's eventually the company would like to have that real-time information. For us, I come back here because this like really red corridor that's going like this, they're putting a, two bus rapid transit lines. That's kind of the south entrance and the north entrance to the city. Um, and I can get into the politics of that later, but I happen to know some transit um, organizers and an NGO that was particularly worried about pedestrian deaths, which are incredibly high and particularly, um, we know from other data, affect poor people, um, older people, people with disabilities more. And so they're a really big issue, but they're often really not made visible to the government because of concerns with police and people not involving the police in accidents. So this data set was able, because we tracked other information that people would say, including images from pictures and stuff, we didn't have a great representation of pedestrian accidents or accidents involving pedestrians, but we had enough on that corridor to show how frequently they occurred close to a pedestrian bridge, which is like an overpass, which is kind of the going standard of terrible urban planning that people will present as a solution. And so we, I made a visualization just of those to show, look, people are getting hit when they could be walking across this bridge, which seems to say there's a reason that they're not. And that, you know, that's just kind of one example of how this ended up being more of a policy tool because it is a snapshot in time. Um, 
And to my knowledge, there still isn't any real time. I think Waze and Google Maps, when this was happening, Google Maps was in beta for traffic. There was no accident data. I think now they're trying, I mean, Uber is there. There could be other potential places for that real time data, but I think a GIS data set for policymakers was helpful to at least some. Um, now it's out of date, but you know, that's my incomplete answer. Questions? That was a, a great talk, and um, I I was particularly uh, fascinated by um, by the story of your research. You know, of, um, going in with one um, intention and then facing um, a difficulty, a challenge, and then and then moving on from that. And um, and I I'm, I'm just curious whether um, these uh, decisions were made at the time or, or just, I just wanted to see, you know, like to see your um, thinking process, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it happened in the field um, or, you know, off the field. Um, yeah. That's a great question. It's a much longer story. Um, I actually first met this, uh, the head of this startup when I first moved to Nairobi in the beginning of 20, 13, 2014, and he met me. I was a planner, very interested in GIS and kind of critical GIS, and he said, oh, I have all this data, but I've never looked at it. Like, do you want to take a look? Um, and so that was the first time I'd seen their raw data, saw that it really didn't have any coordinates, but in being a previous transportation planner and someone who talks to taxi drivers and bus drivers whenever I can, I had kind of started to pick up how people were navigating Nairobi and thought about oh, is there a way we could start putting together this landmark database to really understand, you know, in GIS you have points of interest data sets, like now you can kind of scrape it from Google Maps, but at the time there just wasn't, that didn't exist for Nairobi, um, and the like Google Maps updates really slowly. Uh, so I worked with some of their, I think they were interns at the time, and it was really early days, and so really this landmark database was like a three-year passion project that then finally when I got the right visas and got the, the startup had taken off and you know everything aligned, then we decided to put together this project as a way of testing whether we could develop the NLP and really make it both a policy tool and a money stream. And neither of those were like totally successful, but it was a really great sort of way to work with them. But yeah, I mean, that's why I kind of give this with the caveat of like this was not a drop in, throw together a project and drop out. Um, yes, that's my time, but I'm happy to talk more later. Hi everyone, my name is Sujia. I'm a first year PhD student at the School of Information. And today I'm going to present the paper, Random, Messy, Funny, Raw, Things Tests as Intimate Reconfigurations of Social Media. And this is one work that is accepted to CHI 2020. Here, I would like to thank my collaborators, uh, Dinai, Jun, Kerry, and Nilofar. And also, um, I would like to ask for a favor because it's my Kai practice talk. So if you have any suggestions to my talk, please feel free to send me an email or Slack me or send a uh, talk with me afterwards. Thank you. So Instagram, it's a, a popular social media platform that is based on video and image sharing. And in recent years, we have found a unique phenomenon where people have created a secondary private account well, they call their main account real Instagram. They call their secondary account Finsta, which is fake Instagram. And according to the users on their secondary account, they are posting photos and videos that are silly, ugly, vulnerable, or otherwise unacceptable, unacceptable on the other social media platforms. And in order to understand the phenomenon, in this research, we asked the question, how and why do users create and maintain Finsta? And specifically, we are looking at the uh, problem with the view of reconfiguration of technology. So following the feminism researchers such as Suchman, we draw attention to the inventive yet taken for granted labor hidden in the background that are necessary to the success of complex socio-technical arrangement. 
And in our work, we find that the users have reconfigured the platform Instagram in three ways. From an idealized, in their self-presentation, they have reconfigured the Instagram platform from an idealized, presenting an idealized self to unserious messiness and presenting an obligate positivity to vulnerability. And they have turned the superficial interactions to deep engagement. So how are we investigating Finsta? We're using a qualitative method that contains two parts. Uh, the first part is interviews with Finsta users, where we use convenient and snowball sampling, and we recruit term participants, age ranges from uh, 18 to 26, so mainly young users. And also, uh, the exposing my Finsta videos on YouTube. There's one popular form of videos on YouTube where micro celebrities are exposing the content of their Finsta. On the, uh, on the YouTube platform. So we collect the 10 most recent videos and also the more than 200 screenshots for analysis. And the reason for us to use the two methods is that through the interviews, we can interact with, with the users and get in-depth information, but uh, because we care about their privacy, so we did not ask them to expose their content to us. Well, on the, on the YouTube videos, we're able to see what exactly do they post on the um, on their Finsta, and also at the same time, because they are not aware of the presence of researchers, we are able to get some um, surprising findings uh, from the YouTube videos, such as stigmatized content and also um, some uh, secrecy content. So let's come to the result. We are presenting the result in three folds. So we are drawing from the um, self-presentation theory from Goffman, where he thinks that self-presentation can be seen as a performance on the theater stage. So we'll first illustrate how the things that users are setting the stage, and then how they are performing on the stage, and also their reflections. And also in the process, we're constantly comparing their Rinsta and Finsta. This is also how the um, participants are telling us because to them, Finsta is a place to put any other things that is not captured in the public facing social media channels. So they are constantly comparing their Rinsta with their Finsta. The most important step for setting the stage is to crafting out the audience. Well, we find that on their Rinsta, their account is always public, and also they have an unregulated audience. On their Finsta, the account is usually private, and they have a strict, gate, strict gatekeeping process. They only allow close friends in, and also for the people they don't want to be in, they even actively block those people outside so that they don't find their account. And also, uh, selecting audience is an ongoing process. We find that Finsta users will constantly review their followers, and uh, if the relationship is not closed anymore, they will just remove the people outside their Finsta account. So this is how they are crafting the audience and setting up the stage. And how do they perform on Finsta and do their self-presentation? Here is where we find the three kinds of reconfigurations, which the first one is presenting an, uh, from their idealized self to presenting an unserious messiness on their Finsta. What does it mean? So to give an example, participant five uh, likes to dance during her free time. And her Rinsta is a place to put really good dance photos. But on her Finsta, it's a place to put her falling while dancing or making a bad face while dancing. We also find that when people are presenting on their Rinsta, they are aware of a professional network that they are facing with. While Finsta becomes a place for them to put things that are not safe for work. And also in the screenshots we analyzed, we find that people also put things that are stigmatized, for example, uh, things related to drug or risky photos. So they have turned an idealized self-presentation on Rinsta to the unserious messiness on their Finsta. And besides, we also find that they have turned an obligate positive self-image into vulnerability. For them, Rinsta is a place to put really positive things. It's like Finsta, but almost the best possible version, where if they have no problems. But Finsta becomes a place for them to post all the negative things, for example, bad grades, bad tests, or bad relationships. And we also find that ex extends to the emotions that they share. But Rinsta is a place to put really positive and happy things. 
uh, things that become a place to vent negative emotions such as angriness, depression, and anxiety. And in the YouTube screenshots that we analyzed, we find one specific kind of uh, content, which is the crying selfies, just as what is shown here, which is the participant will post themselves crying and express the negative emotions through the captions. And through presenting an alternative version of self, we find that the interaction on Rinsta and Finsta also becomes different. It turns from a superficial interaction to deep engagement. On Rinsta, they are Care for, they, they, they care about reaching a wide audience and get validation from the audience. So for example, they care about the number of likes. Um, and they also get those kind of validation from comments, but they admit that the comments sound superficial. For example, you look nice, you look good, or things like that. But on Finsta, it becomes a place that they don't care about the validation from a large or wide range of audience, and also they feel like the comments are more meaningful. So they have turned a superficial engagement into lengthier text, engagement through lengthier text. And it does not only happen in the comments, but also the way they present themselves. We find that on Rinsta, it's usually an image and video based um, content, just like what Rinsta, what Instagram is designed for. But on Finsta, it will post content that are very heavily uh, focused on text. So it can be an unrelated picture plus a long text. We find that both in our interviews and also in the YouTube screenshots. And although I think uh, we have said that on Finsta they have present both uh, a serious messiness and also the vulnerability, we actually find a shift there where at first they only present their unserious messiness part, and later after they become more familiar with the norms of Finsta, they turn it into a vulnerability. So those are their performance on Finsta. And how do they reflect on their Finsta use? First, Finsta is a place for them to have an alternative self-presentation. It's a safe place that they don't have to worry too much about. Finsta is also a place for them to share and solicit emotional support from their peers. Besides, it's a place for them to have genuine and deep interaction with friends. What does Finsta mean? So we have seen that the users have reconfigured the platform Instagram, and who, specifically, who configures technology and how. In this case, we find that young people are facing with mounting social pressures, and they reconfigure Instagram and change the purposes, norms, expectations, and currencies. So they're doing that by using the exact, uh, existing platform affordances and also the existing friend groups on Instagram. And they have carved out small spaces accessible only to close friends. And in that small, small space, they have turned an idealized self into a serious messiness, turned an obligate positivity into vulnerability, and they have turned a superficial interaction to deep and more intimate engagement. And following such man, we call this procedure intimate reconfiguration. From an individual level, they are presenting themselves both on Rinsta and Finsta to participants. It's a more complete self-representation. And for the Instagram platform, both Rinsta and Finsta are supporting the platform and they together uh, represent the platform Instagram. So we have talked about how things have helped the users to present an alternative self and to help them share emotions and to help them to engage in deep uh, interaction with their audiences. However, while they have find an escape from the other social media, uh, we want to point out that it's not a ut utopia because with the new norms, new expectations also arrive. Um, so although people share, all, all of them share imperfect and down-to-earth content, so people feel like there's an expectation to be imperfect and down-to-earth. And although it's a place for them to get emotional support, they also feel like they should give emotional support to others. And also, the existence of those Exposing My Finsta videos means something because it should, should be a private account where people share those secret things, but the YouTube bloggers are using those videos to draw attention from the audiences. So in this, uh, in this sense, the alternative self becomes a currency 
that they are using on the platform. Then with the new expectations, will there be another Finsta for Finsta? Thank you. For one question, uh, or a couple, a couple short questions. So I'm curious um, both about like why didn't you use front stage, backstage? Are you pulling on that part of Goffman, and why not? Um, thinking about this as uh, dealing with context collapse. Right, and a way to kind of more parsimoniously draw boundaries among different sorts of audiences. Um, maybe Altman, not just Goffman, so I'm just wondering. Yeah, yeah. so um, I think we did not refer, we only refer to Goffman when we are saying setting the stage and performing on the stage, uh, uh, but we did not engage in the front stage and backstage. I think in the interviews, the participant does say sometimes that um, I had an authentic self on Finsta, which can be the backstage, but most of the time, there's, what they are saying is that I think both parts are important for me. I don't not only need my Finsta, I actually also need my Rinsta. So I think uh, in that sense, we are not differentiating the front stage or backstage because to our participant, there's not exactly a backstage there. Um, but we are using the platform to add some fun to the title so that we can say that they are presenting themselves on the stage. And uh, regarding secondary account, I think there is a context collapse um, uh, in things that which uh, we also detailed in the paper, which is they are not avoiding a certain group of people, maybe, but mostly it's just for alternative self presentation. It's they are already presenting them, they are already benefit from presenting themselves in an alternative way. And they are choosing their audience that they feel comfortable to share this alternative self and they can come from different contexts in their life. So this is what we find in the interview. <laughs> Thank you, great talk. Uh, Fascinating stuff. I'm curious whether people, um, everyone you interviewed or talked to had both a Rinsta and a Finsta. Um, if anyone didn't have a Rinsta and only had a Finsta, and um, if so, or if not, uh, is, what is the utility they have in the having the real Instagram account? Like, did you get a sense of why people still had that uh, public facing one in addition to the more vulnerable, honest one? Yeah, so in our sample, um, many people, all people still have their Rinsta account, but I think they're, the use of their Rinsta account is different because some of them um, actually do business on Instagram, which means that their Rinsta by default have a professional audience. So their definition of Finsta might be a little bit different from the others, but that's the case our our interview. So, but I'm sure there are cases that we have not covered where people will only have their Finsta. And is there a second part of your question? Yeah, because they still like the best version of self that they'd like to present to others, then they still want to get validation from the others, but at the same time, they feel need of presenting something else that cannot be satisfied on not only Instagram, but any other platform. So that's, so I think they are satisfied with, with what they can do on, the, uh, on their things, to, uh, on their rings tab, but they need something else. So it does not mean that they do not need those perfect self anymore. 